medicine in many ways has become a one size fits all cookbook approach. And the reality is, is that we are all different. I mean, fortunately, we are the same in the sense that our systems, you know, operate the same, but we're impacted so differently. Um, you know, and if you look at hormones, I mean, hormones is, you know, perhaps one of the more complicated areas, but to, to think that, you know, estrogen deficiency is the same for one woman as it is for another woman is, is just really short-sighted. And so, you, you know, you can't, you can't just treat with a, a one-size-fits-all approach. And, uh, and I think, so that's, that's one thing. And I think also too. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of wellness at the speed of light. I'm your host, Dr. Stefano Sinecropi. Could not be more pumped up today to have Dr. Christy Prouse on the program. She is a renowned OBGYN who is in Toronto. She is doing incredible things in women's health. Uh, I was introduced to her by a friend, uh, Margaret, who uh, really, really got me excited. And I've had an opportunity to just go through all the things that you've done and doing in your career with the um, Institute for Hormonal Health and the other pro science and humans, all these amazing programs you're doing. And you're so dialed into this thing that I just obsess about. And that is combining all the good from Western medicine with all the good from Eastern medicine and everything in between all these complementary methods to get our population better because we we have a mess on our hands. So again, so thankful for you being on the show today. And this one is one that people just need to turn in. Even if I e even if I need to wake them up at three in the morning and say, you got to watch this <laughs> podcast, because that that's how good the information is going to be. Oh, very good. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited as well. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. Of course. Thank you. Again, thank you. Thank you. So let's just, you know, there's, there's different ways that we could, we could go controversial to begin, or we could just go simple. So I'm just going to start with, with the, with the simple, very simple question. Why the passion on women's health, hormonal health, cortisol management, everything you're doing to help women? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think if it goes right back to the beginning in women's health, you know, it's more about was following my heart. And when I got into medical school, OBGYN was where I headed in the first place. I bounced around to a few other surgical specialties, but ultimately came back to OBGYN. And I think for the most part, people understand that uh, the obstetric side of it and how that would be exciting and, you know, being an important part of you know, people's probably the highlight sometimes of, of their life is a very attractive part of it. But then on the surgical side of it, too, um, what many don't know is that gynecology is a very broad surgical specialty. And we often do the surgical procedures in three different ways, laparoscopic, vaginal and abdominal surgery. So for me, that was the part of it that really grabbed my attention and kept my mind uh, going and busy and and happy and all that sort of stuff. But the reality is, you know, in, in busy centers, high volume, um, you know, raising twin girls at home, uh, you know, and, and the life that everybody else does, and that wasn't really anything special about mine, but it really did start catching up with me, you know, in obstetrics and gynecology, right? There's a lot of late nights and um, and even those late nights, you know, are very frequent on occasion. And so, you know, what what first started happening for me was really more the fatigue. But of course, fatigue in that scenario, you can excuse away as being normal, right? And then I started getting into um, irritability, which again was not like me. I mean, you know, you know who you are. You know how you show up in the world every day. So when you start showing up differently, you know, something something's off here. But again, you, you know, we we say, well, yeah, I'm stressed. Well, no wonder I'm stressed. But then we just leave it at that, right? But it was the foggy thinking that really captured my attention because I could not afford to, um, you know, not be on my game, and. That's when I really started to look elsewhere. Like, what what is going on with me? And um, I went to see a traditional Chinese medicine doctor and a naturopathic doctor all in the same morning because that's what a Type A personality does. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and they both came to the very same conclusion, and that was something called cortisol dysregulation or adrenal fatigue is actually what they called it. And I'd never heard of adrenal fatigue. My mind, of course, as a trained physician, goes to the extremes of disease, Addison's and Cushing's. Well, I knew I didn't have Addison's and Cushing's, but how is it that these two other practitioners are coming to the same conclusion by very different means, by the way, too, right? You know, how is it? And 
you know, what do I need to be paying attention to? And so that's where I started to understand that what I was experiencing was actually the physiologic consequences of stress, burnout. Yes. And right. And so naturopathic world typically calls it adrenal fatigue, which I think is a bit of a misnomer. Um, but it's basically a dysregulated cortisol pattern that isn't the extremes of disease, thank goodness, right? But it's in this middle ground. And there's a lot of people that are struggling with it. So when I started to feel better, and part of that process, by the way, of feeling better was, you know, physician heal thyself. Well, that translated to education and looking to, at things differently. Absolutely having to open my eyes to looking at medicine through a different paradigm uh, because I wasn't getting bed, better with what I knew. My my toolbox, uh, you know, if, if I was going to make myself better, I would have made myself better, but I, I was falling short on that. And uh, so with feeling better, that's when I was like, okay, wait a second. I am not the only one that's going to be feeling this way. And so that's when I opened up the Institute for Hormonal Health. That's back in 2011. Um, set up a practice that is um, truly an integrative practice, which basically means that we have a naturopathic doctor, myself, who's got training in functional medicine, along with any other, you know, allied healthcare professional that can help us out. It's a whole mind, body, spirit, you know, effort. And, um, and really, you know, have been impacting women in a substantial way and not just by focusing on the hormones, so even though it's called the Institute for Hormonal Health, you know, to think that that's just hormones, which is what I kind of thought back in the beginning it was going to be, was so short-sighted, right? So here I am as a, as a OBGYN who now deals with brain neurotransmitters and gastrointestinal tract, <laughs> you know? So it's been a really, really fun experience. And with all that I've gathered over the years has led me into different positions of oversight where, you know, now I can make an impact on a broader scale. So kind of honed, honed yeah. my art, over the last um, decade and a bit, and uh, and now teaching the next generation, getting the word out there so that we can really make a difference and make impact for for women. Uh, you know, interestingly though, again, OBGYN, you'd think I only see women, but in fact, about 15% of my patients are males. And that's because from a hormone perspective, we're the same. It's just differences in, in levels and, and whatnot. I mean, that was, that was wonderful. I mean, uh, you know, Amazing. And I could not give, you know, more kudos to you for what you're doing. And it, I love the way you say uh, that you had to open your, uh, you know, you kind of think in a, in a different way. And, and same thing kind of happened to me a couple of years ago, where just watching patient after patient after patient being metabolically sick. Yeah, I was taking care of their spine condition, but they were ill. And I just felt, and I had always done kind of dietary management, some other things with my patients, because it's real important in spine surgery to, 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 to do some of that stuff. But I, I, I was not dialed into the importance of, you know, cortisol, hormonal health, uh, all these different ways that diets interact with our, you know, the the access of of, of hormonal release. Um, talking about things like, uh, you know, intermittent fasting and and veganism, and all these different things, and then getting into the whole biohack, mm -hmm. you know, world, which is is has become my my huge passion. Never in a million years would I, you know, thought of myself as being referred to this wellness doctor, you know, the, the, this healing doctor. If, if you would have told me this two and a half years ago, I would have just <laughs> laughed. I said, you know, I said, well, you know, maybe we've, we, you know, we've had too many drinks or something. I don't, I don't know what's <laughs> going on. And, and now we're just having these, these delusions. But I, I, my transformation, I mean, you're inspiring me just by your first answer. My transformation is so profound. I see the world in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. And I've made a 180 with the way that I treat people. We're opening these, we're doing all these things. But my, my biggest thing that I'm doing right now and literally, you just you almost describe what I, I'm I'm in the middle of of writing this book, which is going to release early next year, and it's all about one spine surgeon's hardcore spine surgeon, you know, transformation from 
everything, surgery, you know, uh, 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 all the stuff, medications, you know, what we're taught, what you were taught in, in, right. in, in school for OBGYN. We, we, we went through very similar training and then a complete transformation and shift and seeing that we cannot tolerate things the way they are now. Number one, a lot of people are suffering, right? You, you mm -hmm. went through, through a crash and burn kind of, yeah. you know, scenario, which how many physicians are going through this right now? I mean, it is, I just posted, <laughs> you know, recently, about this neurosurgeon who's living in the mountains with his dog, like doing photography, who's who's so disgruntled with today's yeah. medical system, he just he can't take it, you know, anymore. And so I love the thing that you said, and I, I wanted to bring. I I just did something on social about one of my favorite movies, which is Groundhog Day. <laughs> and our people think about it. I mean, it's a great movie, right? I mean, Bill Murray. I could watch that movie six times a day, and it's just like it's fresh because you always pick up little things if you watch it, but. That movie is perfect. Those are people in today's medical care yeah. system. They keep going to the same well, and it doesn't make sense. And anytime, you know, people like us come and say, hey, there's these other things. There's so much resistance to thinking outside the box. I mean, you say acupuncture, that's a, that has become more accepted, but other things that that you know we 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 all kind of talk about like for example adrenal fatigue syndrome and you're right it is a little bit of a misnomer and how many dollars have been spent to try to debunk that by the powers that be we don't have to get into that but talking about photobiomodulation and all all these other things which have tremendous data behind them tremendous right why why is it so difficult for I'm going to ask you in two ways. Why is it so difficult for our our patients or or just people that are just listening to or, or just starting to listen to what we say? And why is it so difficult for our colleagues to buy into these things, which it's not pseudoscience? I cannot stop saying it. It's not pseudoscience. It's yeah. real. Yeah. That's why you're an OBGYN. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon. Listen, think about what we're talking about right now and how it's so different than what's been talked about for all these years. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, to answer perhaps the physician question first is because I had the blinders on too, yes. right? And I don't know what it is. It's not like maybe it's a bit of an arrogance in our profession where we're taught one thing and, you know, and if it isn't that, then it couldn't be so. Right. And so, which is very short sighted, because, of course, most of the world has practiced a different type of medicine for thousands of years longer than we have. But I do do believe that there is a bit of an, an arrogance there. You know, that shows up all the time. You know, if, if a physician doesn't know something, they often just say no. Yeah. <laughs> and and, you know, until you are stuck in a position yourself and, and there we go again. Right. Physician heal thyself when you're you know, I need I need to make some change and I'm coming up short. It, that's often the impetus for for change. So I do think that there's a little bit of that. I think also doctors are getting really, really busy and on overload. And it's much easier to follow the guidelines that have been presented to you than to do the deep dive into the research, right? We're, we're busy, we're, we're on the front line. And you know, so I think that is, is probably part of it. And I think on the patient side of things, well, and actually to go back to the to the physician side, you know, one of, one of the very interesting things, particularly with the work that I do with hormones, it's basic medical physiology. It's it's not it's not like I'm even you know off in the off at the ferries uh, coming up with new new ideas or new concepts. It's actually really basic medical physiology, and I think that's one way where medicine got really fancy, and we did forget about the basics, right? Like a body temperature actually means something, <laughs> you know. It's uh, so. yeah, yeah. So. You know, I do see that part of it, and I and I've been there, so I know what it's like to have blinders on for sure. And then from the patient perspective, you know, I think culturally, for a very long time, we have put doctors on a pedestal and have just simply trusted that what they're doing, that they are experts. And of course, we are experts, but we are, you know, the the way our healthcare system is set up in North America is a very siloed system. Right. As an OBGYN, I deal with OBGYN issues. But that's what I was saying earlier. Now I'm an OBGYN that's dealing with brain neurotransmitters and the gastrointestinal tract. Yes. Right. And, 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 um, you know, beyond. So I, I think it really does take a sort of a collective paradigm shift to see things differently. And it's not even, it's not like we're scrapping the conventional medical approach. Right. If, if I'm having a heart attack, I'm not showing up on my naturopath's doorstep. 
right? If I break my arm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to my TCM doctor. So, you know, I think we do things, some things very well in the conventional medical model. And I also think that there are gaps and I happen to fall into one of those gaps and realize that it was a gap and that I wasn't going to be the only one. And it turns out that it's actually probably a much bigger deal than I even imagined. And then you throw the last few years into the mix as well, which has really changed the landscape um, for a lot of people. I mean, not only are I think are people feeling sicker and run down and all that sort of stuff, but I think also people are starting to take ownership of their own health and they're doing a deeper dive. And of course, we now have access to podcasts like yours and whatnot, where where uh, patients, if there is an interest or a, a need, right, and they're not getting the answers that they need from the conventional medical world, well, they're doing their own research. And I love how educated patients are becoming. I actually, you know, whenever I have a, another doctor or student or whoever shadow with me with my patients, I'm always kind of sitting in the background, kind of watching, imp so impressed by how much my patients understand. And I think that's a really, really big part of medicine. We're teachers. We're meant to teach our patients. And if we can teach our patients this, the science and the physiology behind this, then they understand why they're feeling the way they're, they're feeling, uh, but also why they need to do what they need to do and why they're doing it translates to better compliance and therefore better results. So, you know, what we do is um, can only... <laughs> We only look good if our if our patients are following through with, with what we're asking them to do. And I'm always amazed actually at, at how willing my patients are to follow in many cases some pretty significant protocols because you know if you're getting at foundational healing and really going for the root of the matter and you know cellular healing, um, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not here, take this pill, you'll feel better in the morning. Um, no, it takes effort. And yet once that transformation has happened, wow, is that ever fun to watch, right? And it sounds like it's the same transformation that both you and I went through. So we know firsthand how, how cool that is. So to be able to translate that to others and see, um, see our patients really embracing change, cool, very cool. Yeah, I mean, again, you, that you brought up so many things that you know I'd love to get into. So I would say that I'm going to start with the with the last thing you just said. Absolutely, and I talk about my not not just my transformation in the way that I think, because mm -hmm. honestly, I was completely in a silo, completely resistant. The things that we're using now to treat patients didn't even think it was never on my radar, never a thing. However. Before I even went down that road, I myself and, you know, people that follow me know, I mean, I, you know, at, at one point I, I was such a busy spine surgeon. I'm still super busy, not, not quite as busy, I was doing 700 surgeries a year. Wow. And, and I was also experiencing, and, and, you know, they, sometimes they think that we're like superhuman, but we're not because a lot of times they're struggling. They don't understand our fatigue when we get home and things like that. And interestingly enough, although I wasn't living in this silo, you know, I I've always been a, a big gym rat and doing stuff that only can take you so far if you don't fix the other things. And so when I was introduced to a lot of these biohacking modalities, which I like, it, it has completely changed my own personal life. I mean, now I'm still doing a, a large amount of surgery. I'm, I'm teaching, I, I've got, you know, I'm mentoring people. I do the podcast. I'm always on social media. I couldn't be more excited. I'm writing the book and, and, and I'm, full of energy. I have more energy today than I did when I was 30. It's not, and, and it's not even close. It's not even close. And so sharing my own personal stories, physician heal thyself with my, I talk about it all the time with patients that I see for other, you know, for their spine conditions. And, and that's how they're like, oh my God, the doctor's doing it. I need to, at least, I got to give it at least a try. I'm sure you get that a lot. Cause, yeah, cause yeah, yeah. Well, precisely. And that's what patients say. I, I want to do what you're doing. And, and I, and I know, I know what it is because I, I know what it's like to have that flame, you know, fizzling out. And for me now it's been about, oh, I don't know, somewhere in that 15 to 20 year range of feeling better. And, and as you say, like not only better, but like better than I have ever felt. Uh, and I think part of that is just being in alignment, right. And, and doing yep. what 
you know is um you know to be true and and what most resonates with you but really the the reality is is that you know some of the foundational and core change that you can make mind body spirit everything right because it's not just a physical body um that's where we get our blow for freedom and how how could you not possibly want to share that with everybody <laughs> when, you, when you feel like i you know i i've i've got i've got some answers here and they make a difference no, you know, absolutely. And I could see your your energy. You, it's funny because we kind of feel the same. It's like, I just want to shout. I always say like shouting from the rooftops. I'm going to spend the rest of my career just shouting from the rooftops. Hey, there's so much you can do. Let's use Margaret's favorite term, CEO of our own healthcare. Yeah, I, I yeah. just use it all the time. I try to give her, she knows. But I, I always give her credit for it. But it's it's incredible. You got people have to be CEOs of their own healthcare. And yeah, I yeah. spend a lot of time talking to my patients about how important it is, especially when I see that they are looking at us almost as a parent, like, what do I do? You cannot just rely even on what you or I tell you. You have to do your own research and because you know yourself better. And I love what you said, you know, about how excited you are when you're, you know, you've got students and you're just kind of, you know, listening to, to patients and what they know about their own health care. It's incredible. And we definitely need to to preach this. They've got to be involved in their care. They've got to look around. They've got to, you know, when things are not working, you know, just like, you know, Bill Murray, he tried every everything in the movie Groundhog Day, right? He learned to play the piano and he did it, whatever, but he was still stuck in the loop until he got it, until he was in that spot. And that that's kind of, you know, how I see when people, when the light bulb turns on with you, with me, with our patients, all of a sudden they can get out of it. Oh my God, it's a new day. I feel great. What in the world? And they want to tell everybody. So yeah. people that were treating with all these different biohacking modalities and changing their nutrition and looking at their sleep patterns and having them record their, you know, what how they're sleeping and doing their quantitative EEGs and 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 really fixing their brain and neurofeedback, all this great stuff that I never uttered one word of this stuff, you know, before, you know, a couple of years ago. And now I'm, you know, I, I can't, right? I, I can't be more excited, but you bring up that fact. And this is something that, that we all talk about, those of us that have had this epiphany and how important for us is not to talk down to our patients and, and have that arrogance. You know, my first, I, I have this new, this new series I'm doing where instead of having experts like yourself, which is, you know, kind of my main show, of this other show where I'm just, it's about the stories. It's about patients coming on and telling us, well, how was your interaction? How did you find the light? How did you heal thyself patient instead of heal thyself doctor? And I had my first episode that I did, I had this, this, this actress, Lourdes Reynolds, and she, she, she found her way out of Hodgkin's lymphoma. She mm. used all this natural stuff. She had a little bit of conventional medicine, but a lot of it was natural. Mm. But it's so funny the way she talks about her first interactions with doctors where they're like, no, nope, you got to do it like this and you have to do it like that. And then she's like, oh, but I, you know, I'd really like to try this or I did some reading and they're, and, you know, kind of you get the eye rolling going and you're like, oh my God, this lady's trying to kill herself. She has no idea. We got into this whole discussion of how it's important to understand people's cultural differences and mm -hmm. how they process the medical system and it's not when i say cultural i don't mean like okay they're from this country or that country but no. it's cultural even if it, it, it's it's also are they more holistic are they more kind of hardcore because sometimes you have to go one way or the other and just try to find that you know a kind of a a, a balance mm -hmm. You know, so thanks for bringing that up it's so important for us not to preach to our people we are experts mm -hmm. we're, we're very much experts we've spent years, you know, and then decades, once you're in practice, learning this stuff and honing our skills. But right. we don't have all the, my, my partner, Dr. Nussbaum, he's a world renowned neurosurgeon. And I mean, like his textbook is translated in like 18 languages. He, right. it, uh, and I asked him, how much do we as physicians know about health and, and, and wellness and just treat and, and how bodies work? And he said, very little. Yeah. No, so that's how we have to approach it. Yes. Do we know more than 99%? Yes. But mm -hmm. we, there's another massive gap and yes, thousands of years we've been, we've been treating ourselves through holistic mm -hmm. measures with, and people have done fine. It's infectious mm -hmm. disease that got us, not heart disease, not yeah. obesity, not, yeah. not, not Alzheimer's disease. These are, these are modern, these are diseases of the modern era yeah. because of our food and uh, all this other stuff. So Going into that for a second, and 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 again, what is wrong 
with the guidelines today? Why are the guidelines sometimes just plain old wrong? What is being, what's out there, even through our societies? What, what's your opinion on that? I've had this, this you know, discussion with, with many doctors, one of which was Dr. Mm -hmm. Lufkin, who wrote the book, Lies I Told in Medical School. He's a <laughs> professor at UCLA and USC, and he was just on, yeah. she's like 50% of the stuff I taught in these guidelines. Yeah, doesn't, well, doesn't... I, I I totally understand that too because I think when I when I left the conventional medical model and and really felt that I had to to make a break altogether for my heart more than anything. Interestingly, it was around the conversation with birth control pills. Mm. So, and I knew what I was supposed to be saying, and now I had this understanding of what was true, which. Right. And I, my heart was so conflicted. Now, again, don't mistake that as me saying birth control pills are bad or anything like that. All I'm saying is that I knew what I had been taught to say, and, and I knew otherwise now, and I really was very conflicted about the differences between the two. You know, so I, I think the way that I see the world now, and I'm and in the process of educating others to make that paradigm shift. It's really medicine in many ways has become a one size fits all cookbook approach. And the reality is, is that we are all different. I mean, fortunately we are the same in the sense that our systems, you know, operate yes. the same, but we're impacted so differently. Um, you know, and if you look at hormones, I mean, hormones is, you know, perhaps one of the more complicated areas, but to, to think that, you know, estrogen deficiency is the same for one woman as it is for another woman is, is just really short-sighted. And so, you, you know, you can't, you can't just treat with a, a one size fits all approach. And, uh, and I think, so that's, that's one thing. And I think also too, on the front of how we look at things and how we investigate things, that's changing really dramatically as well. So we now have this whole um, toolbox of functional testing that gives us a ton more detail. I mean, in conventional medicine, right, we kind of get stuck on blood work and imaging. Yeah. And, and and again, not to dismiss that, obviously it has its role, but I think to, to understand that there's actually way more out there and this is where medicine is advancing. It's just amazing the detail that I can get in urine, for example, dried urine testing for hormones that you, you just can't from serum. And so you make your decisions, not just based on an absolute level. I mean, you've, you've got the big picture of hormones and where am I adjusting? And am I bringing somebody in back into physiologic range? Is it balanced with the other hormones? When I give this hormone, is it going to break down into something else that I don't want it to break down into? So when you can start getting these kind of, um, this kind of detailed information, you can make better decisions for your patients. No, I, yeah, ab absolutely. And you know, that, that brings up a good, you know, so just going back to kind of what Dr. Lufkin was saying you know his his concern about the guidelines, and he's very harsh about it. You you should it, it's 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 a really he's a very brilliant doctor. I mean, and he he is completely. And guess what happened to me? He ended up with four chronic diseases, and he was and he said he did everything that the medical he went to his own you know his friends and said they, they did everything that conventional medicine can give him. Guess what? He was getting sicker, and he healed himself. And then he started looking at the guidelines and who's behind it and 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 what are the forces behind it. And if you look at some of the people, for example, for the ADA guidelines for, for diabetes management, and then you look at some of the companies that are behind sponsoring those guidelines, you know, questions. I'm not, you know, my, I'm not here to throw, I'm here to just, we have to ask the questions. We'll put it that way. Ne Absolutely. You know, neither of us are, are in a situation where I'm not going to sit around posting, oh my God, this company, and I investigated this and this guy. There's nothing to do with that. It's it's understanding that there is a much wider and bigger picture when you look at it. And, and the truth is, you know, you got the ADA with, with their guidelines, but yet you have a Jason Fung who, you know, wrote the obesity code, who's just a, it was brilliant on diabetes, who, who's... Basically, the whole premise of his book is 80 something percent of people just going on intermittent fasting. Your diabetes is gone. OK, right. now I'm not saying that he's the be all end all authority and everybody should just go and do intermittent fasting. However, we need to have these conversations and they're not being had at yeah. the level in busy doctor's clinics. Ninety five percent of my patients, because I'm a big intermittent fasting you know, mm -hmm. believer and the science is, is ironclad and 
you know, good luck to people that want to try to debunk that science that that is done. And that's done by the hardcore physicians and great, you know, great work. But 95% of people that I talk to about it, just average, you know, the average Jill and Joe, they come into my office. They've never heard, they have no idea what intermittent fasting is. So I show them the clock and, and, and go through this and tell them about, you know, just how the body processes all, all the stuff, but it is so important for us to, you know, kind of, under like what you're saying, I have an understanding what's behind the way we're thinking about some of these things. It's so much broader. There's so much more that we can give to our patients and integrative health, functional medicine. It's, it's amazing. And with more precision techniques and AI developing and all these things, it's all going to come together to give customizable treatment programs, not even close to a one size fits all. Even people that look might be that they're the same, might be completely different when you really break it down and we use these other technologies. So I just wanted to, you know, just to kind of get into the functional medicine piece and using biomarkers, because you bring up a really good point. There is a lot of pushback in the medical community on using too many biomarkers, just a large amount of biomarkers. And, and the big criticism is, well, you get all this information, like, what are you going to do with it? And my pushback is on that. And I, I'd love to hear what, what you think, because, you know, you, you talk about like looking in, at the bell. My pushback is, yes, I agree. If you don't have the tools or not aware of how to manage it at that point. Yes, getting a hundred data points, it, mm -hmm. it's useless. But in, in the functional medicine world, in the integrative health world, there are very specific protocols you know, utilize, you know, my passion now, and, and obviously we're, we, we are expanding into hormonal and, and all these other things, but looking at how biomarkers change simply by using photobiomodulation, pulsed electromagnetic frequency, yep. oxygen therapy, all these things. And guess what? They change. Yeah. It, it, it's, 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 and, and so we, we, we have tools to, to help them. Guess what? You do intermittent fasting, your biomarkers change right? Yeah. It, there, there's all That's these right. things. What are your thoughts on that pushback from our colleagues on the use of biomarkers, you know, the guys out here, you know, Dr. Hyman, all these guys that are that are that are promoting biomarkers and are building companies and and they know where things are going, right? Sinclair, all these brilliant people. What mm -hmm. what how do you how do you push back? So how do you use biomarkers just just generally? And and what how do you talk to your colleagues about the importance of not just getting the standard you know, blood mm -hmm. work. And yeah, that, yeah. Okay. Your CBC is normal. Oh, you got a clean bill of health, Miss Johnson. I've never seen somebody healthier and they're 150 pounds overweight, have a skin condition, have pedal edema and, 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 and want to be in bed for 18 hours a day. Like how do we get our yeah. colleagues to understand functional integrative medicine? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's hard because it really, it really is a whole different way of thinking and looking at things, right? So it is very, you have to be willing to take off a pair of glasses before you put the new ones on in the first place. So if you're not willing to take it off, then, yeah. but I, I also, you know, yeah. when you see some of the, the, the detail of these tests and the way that they're outlined, it's really kind of hard to argue that, you know, that we're just getting very superficial fluffy information and but more detailed information that does matter so for example with mm -hmm. hormones for me when i'm giving somebody dhea or testosterone i need to understand what the body's going to do with that and you know what's it going to break it down into i don't want to give that to somebody who has you know already high levels of estrogen because that's what happens you break it down into an estrogen i don't want to give estrogen to somebody who's already at risk from a breast cancer perspective from mm -hmm. a hormonal yes. picture whether they've got a family history of it or not right and and you know, so to to have that information up front before you're making decisions is is critical in my mind. And now, you know, if you were to ask me to go back to, you know, another approach, I don't know what I would do. And I think the other the other big important that you address there is the monitoring piece of it. You can see change, right? Patients yes. feel better, which is ultimately your objective, you know, and many could say that's for whatever reason, it's a placebo effect or well, quite frankly, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's no. not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a wonderful thing if somebody's yes. feeling better. Um, but when you've got that objective evidence to support that change. Um, and I think it's equally, you know, you, you know, we, we've often in medicine said, you know, reminded you, patients are not a number. And yet it's interesting how patients want to treat themselves as numbers. They get very interested in, and fascinated with the detail 
because they can see that they're improving. They know they're, they know they're feeling yeah. better, right? So I, I think, you know, it really just takes looking at things differently, getting out of that siloed approach to understand that there are so many things that, that play into it. And, and it's not even just how you look at it, right? If you look at how our system is set up and how long our office appointments are, you know, whatever, we've got a whole system that's designed around the same kind of model of care. You can't possibly do that with in functional medicine. I mean, you've got so many data points that you have to be able to connect the dots, which I do think is where AI is going to make a yes. huge difference. I'm um, chief medical officer for um, a company called Regena Life, and they're basically, you know, we're, we're curating some really, really cool cutting edge um, technology. And uh, one of that focuses is on cardiovascular health mm -hmm. and the overlaying of um, AI onto a CT angio is basically revolutionizing the how how we're even uh, looking at staging cardiovascular yes. disease we've never done that before we've done that with cancer sure but we haven't staged cardiovascular disease and with ai you can see detail that the human eye can't you can yes. distinguish between a hard plaque and a soft plaque um, and therefore what does that translate to your actual your risk of of an event and so i think really things are changing and you know whether doctors like it or not they are changing and patient demand will push this forward. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad medicine. It just means medicine's advancing and, you know, hang on to your hat because <laughs> we're, we're blasting ahead at, at great speeds. And I think we're really just on the cusp of seeing massive change and it will be patient driven. I mean, that's not to say that, you know, the work that you and I are doing, but, you know, obviously that's important, of course, but it's going to be patient demand that that um, makes a difference here. Yeah, I mean, we, we've we got to find ways of getting people off of these endless repetitive loops. You know, there's this one patient that really struck me about a, a, a month ago, you know, without getting into too much details about it, it's nothing to do with kind of what they were coming to see me for, it was just back pain. So it's interesting, I got into this long discussion, they're rural, the husband and the wife, and he, you just look at him, right? As physicians, we just look at people and say, this person is a metabolic, it is a, a bomb went off in this guy and it's a slow bomb and it, it went off over time. And just talking to him about where their health is and whatever. So they had been seeing the same primary care doctor for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So we got into this discussion. I said, give me your, I need to see your medication list. Cause I, I start my blood pressure. I could just feel like started having a little bit of a pounding. I just maybe a little lightheaded. Um, I'm a pretty passionate guy. I get, I get pretty <laughs> into it with my patient. I spent a little bit too much time in that room and I'm sure the other people behind them weren't, weren't, weren't thrilled, but they gave me the medication list, 37 medications, 37. So I started asking them about the medication. Number one, no clue. What 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 the what the meds do? No clue. Oh, that's the green pill. That's the the usual stuff. Right. Had a baggie. Take took out his baggie with all with all his meds. He's like, I have no idea. I take these at nine a.m. and then these at noon. All this stuff. But but yet, diabetes is out of control. Okay, his A one C was high. He he still has a significant blood pressure problem. The guy's depressed. He has probably horrific cardiovascular disease that he's not aware of. You could barely palpate this guy's pulses. He's got pedal edema. He's all these different changes. And all I'm thinking is this guy's not going to make, he won't even, I don't know how he even made it to, 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 to my office today. Right. And I, and I asked him and, and I said, well, why are you continuing to go to the same well and it's interesting. They knew something was wrong because he and his wife go to that. That's and again, this is again. I'm not. I'm not naming names. I'm not doing yeah. anything. But I said. So then we got into. Well, what do you do when you go to the office? Well, they look at a lab and it might be their A1 or whatever, and they change their diabetes pills. They change all their pills up. That's the entire visit. There's no discussion of anything. This guy is dramatically overweight. There is no. Ch I said. Well, what diet plan have we done for you? What have we tried? How can we work? Nothing. Has anybody said, well, maybe, you know, maybe you should look at some medication management for your, you know, obesity. And again, I am much more in the camp of, of uh, you know, holistic ways of, of, of obesity management, but there are people, right? If you're, if you're a resistant diabetic that, that, that is obese, you know, maybe that maybe those are the, the times where GLP ones might be the right, you know, treatment option or, or, or some of these, you know, different bioidentical, you know, things that are out there that, that are in that same kind of camp.
we went through all this stuff. Meanwhile, my patients are seething, you know, in the in the other rooms. And then I couldn't help it. Then I asked his wife, riddled with medical problems, right? And both of them have psychiatric overlay over that. Most of it is depression and anxiety. Of course, they're on pills for that too. Guess what? Not working. Okay, yeah. And so again, like, why are people going to the same well over and over again? It makes no sense. You don't keep the same coach on the team when you're, you know, yeah. when, when when you win, when you're at the bottom of the division every single year. Those coaches don't stay around for a long time, but yet people do that with their healthcare, and I'm not picking on any particular doctor. It's just it's the way that that we manage and and treat people. And I think that that what people like we can do, because obviously we, we're both dedicated to do this, is at least give people the tools in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. Another thing that our friend says, you know, constantly, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. tools in the toolbox and all these things. And I and I can't, you know, I can't be more passionate about that because they don't know what the tools in the toolbox are. And they're relying sometimes on the completely wrong people to give them the information. And then they might seek, you know, things on 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 social or wherever they're going. And guess what? Sometimes they get great advice and sometimes they get advice from, you know, somebody that, you know, some construction worker that wants to tell the world how GLP ones work and, and everyone should be on it. So it's a difficult thing. So I think experts really need to be out there publicly talking about it because yes, it's going to be driven by patients, but it's mm -hmm. also going to be driven from inside out as those of us that want to break out yeah. of the system that were traditionally trained, just kind of come out like Neo did when he comes out of his cocoon, right? When when he takes yeah. his pill and you see him just, you know, just getting all the goop off of his yeah. face. Yeah. Then we go in and we start ripping, you know, the cocoons off of everybody else. That's and true. that's what we need to be doing. And I and I and I'm like, I'm going to be just pounding the table over and over and, and this could not be you know more uh, uh, you know uh, of a wake up call and i think everything you're saying is just it's brilliant because you're just we're just talking to people we're just we're just trying to you know kind of get this you know out of them you know any anything else that you think that we need to be to be doing to really get you know people out of this out of this this fog this this wool it's it's like the wool pulled over their eyes like what do yeah. you tell? So how do you tell patients that, you know, and, and I know you're in a completely different thing, but when you started to have that epiphany and your mm -hmm. heart was in a different place, mine is too. I look mm -hmm. at people and I'm like, you need these other things. I mean, you need, we need to go a completely different way. So even if they're for spine condition, as like, it's not even ethically right knowing what I know now for yeah. me not to give them that info. I have to tell them that to, even yeah. if it's done. So how, especially when you weren't in this, because now people are going to you for some of this stuff specifically, knowing yeah. that you're an expert and you're, you're the person to go to. How did you do it before when people are like, ah, that's, that's, that's nothing. Just give me a pill or I just, just, I need a procedure or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, it? Yeah. It's interesting. Well, I, I think, you know, going back to saying that I, I myself needed to leave the conventional world behind, which was pretty scary. Like it, if, if I think back now to it, right, we're around, again, we're over, over 10 years ago now leaving the hospital setting. So I was giving up my surgical practice. I was giving up labor and delivery and, and leaving the conventional world. And I, and I really, my heart, I had to do that that way. And I actually got some pushback and some grief for, you know, why don't you, um, you know, kind of walk in both worlds for a little while and test the waters, but my, my heart couldn't handle that. And so, you know, when I switched over, there was no mistaking from a patient perspective That's who they were coming to see. So it wasn't like, you know, I had my traditional shingle hung and then I was doing the bait and switch and, and here you are, surprise, surprise. You know, the way that I've set up my office right from the first um, encounter with a patient, which of course is not me, uh, they have an understanding that this isn't a regular doctor's office. This isn't a regular naturopath's office. Um, this is how it works. And for us too, the other big hurdle was I was stepping outside of our Canadian medical healthcare system and how each of the provinces, right, will you know, basically through our taxes, cover the cost of healthcare. So people are not used to opening up their pocketbook to, to pay their doctor. Um, that was actually one of the biggest hurdles. And interestingly, it was not just a hurdle for patients. It was also a hurdle for me. It was weird. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and felt greasy on, on some, on, on some level. 
And, but with time, when, when patients and, and are the biggest um, and biggest compliment and, and the biggest sort of proof that proof in the pudding is that it's referrals from other patients that drive the business, right? So if you're getting results, everybody's telling everybody and, um, and then they're knocking on your door. So I never really had to struggle so much with um, doing things differently as much as there were other hurdles and um, getting over that. And, you know, just funny because it's, you know, largely American audience, um, you know, Canadians were, this is, you know, ridiculously expensive. And if I'm going to be paying kind of this much money, well, then my expectations are, you know, I expect this much more. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I, I can't run this ship any tighter yeah. than I am. But then we would get American patients coming up and they were like, oh my goodness, this is so cheap. I can't yeah, believe yeah, it. And I'm like, I true. know. <laughs> So, you know, there, there's, you know, different things that we bring to the table and different expectations. And, but I think over, over time, it became pretty obvious that we were making significant impact in a way, you know, by, by, by the time patients actually get through to see us, they've often seen multiple doctors, multiple naturopaths, you know, whatnot. And, um, and yet we're still getting them better. Right. So that is a very helpful way of, of overcoming what you're saying is how do you, how do you talk to your patients about doing things a little differently? Uh, you know, no different than now how you feel that you have to share what you know now know. Of course, I have to share, you know, what what is the alternative? And patients don't want that. When they understand and you educate them, and I, I, again, to go back to that, like, it's very important that we educate our patients. And, you know, if they understand the differences between the two, you know, they often, if not always, make a good choice. You know, very rarely are, are, do people insist on on something that isn't good for them. <laughs> You know, well, you know what I said, a couple of things. I will say that, yes, I think that the Americans that are traveling there, right, to see you, they tend to be sort of, you know, financially better. And again, amazing for you that that you're getting the, you know, Amer I mean, think about it, America, you, you the, the patients have to go see her because they're not getting the care here. We got we just really got to wake up. That's a whole that's a whole other discussion. But it's so interesting on the cash piece. And I talk about it. I've actually because because so many of these uh, kind of the biohacking uh, uh, modalities, uh, naturopathic care, functional integrative medicine, it's not covered. I was at DC a couple months ago lobbying for photobiomodulation to be covered. Mm. Both the FDA and the CDC fully support photobiomodulation cool. to help patients with pain management and things like that, but yet it's not covered by our payers. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's, it's insane. We have this laser therapy that can, it, it's, it's dramatic, something I didn't know about. And, 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 all, and now I know all the laser therapy docs that are big proponents of it in the United States. And we all have the same experience. It's incredible for pain. It's, it's incredible, incredible yeah. for yeah. pain management, for, for, uh, uh, you know, like nerve pain, for, uh, peripheral neuropathy, uh, um, uh, chemotherapy induced neuropathy. The fact that people are not getting these treatments, yeah. is tragic it's tragic yes. and i'm yeah. embarrassed that i learned about this stuff two years ago and i didn't know about it when i started because i could have helped thousands and thousands of my own yeah. patients yeah. healing and with and with their with, with their pain yeah well you know you know what's interesting is photobiomodulation and laser therapy i'm using as a gynecologist for, for vaginal health it works. Oh. it's so i mean it's not and this is this really speaks to um you know when you get at this kind of healing at, at the root, at the cellular level, um, it's amazing the difference you can make. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, a foot or a vagina. It's, you know, it's, uh, it works very effectively. Agreed. Well, I was, I, I was just a complete tangent. I will tell you that the, the, my two favorite specialties to talk to in the doctor's lounge with, with no question, urologists and OBGYNs because the jokes <laughs> that are told in the doctor's lounge have to stay in the doc. If I yeah. told one of those jokes on social, I'm done. That's it. Cancel, <laughs> cancel, cancel. But it is some of the funniest stuff. I mean, you guys are the funniest people. <laughs> when, when you just kind of throw around like this, tab, it's, it shouldn't even be taboo. It's the human body, but yeah. it's absolutely hysteric. I mean, the stuff yeah. I've heard, at, at, you know, out of, you know, all your guys, those, those two specialties, because you're, you know, you're working in that area that we don't exactly. you know, like to talk about, whether it's males yeah. or females, <laughs> but just, 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 
Just going back to to the because th this is a message that's really important. It is it really is at the heart. Let's go back to a lot of things that we're doing right now with medications that have so many side effects. Listen again. Number one, the show is not about you know nothing. You or I say should be taken as as at medical advice. They need to see who they need to see, and they need to make an appointment and and see us or whoever they want to see you know, for the, these things. But when we talk about different medicines and procedures that people are seeking, and I, I'll tell you, America, Canada is very similar. I always, I mean, uh, Canada is just America North. No, 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 no. If I love Canadians. Like, again, I have so many relatives in Canada. It's the same. I go up there. It's like the same. There's not, it's not like, oh my God, it's a completely different. It's the same. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's some differences. If you go to Montreal, it's wildly different than Toronto, but there's no difference than New Orleans and Minneapolis. It, they're, right. they're different. That That's the difference. Is, but we're we're North Americans. We this is the the way we do things. What's crazy though is there is an obsession with I need a pill or I need this surgery. Mm -hmm. And 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 I'll tell you, I talk about this openly. I have li literally in the last, especially year, I've gotten into arguments, arguments with patients that are insisting that I mm -hmm. do an operation on them, insisting. Mm. Or that I give them some met, and I'm like, there's all these other options. Yes, I do a lot of spine surgery, but it has to be for specific, yeah. very, very specific indications. Just like if I give a patient, I, I don't, but like a doctor, give a patient like a, a, a cholesterol medication. It has to be specific, and that has to be worked up before, because that medication, right, and we know the statins, you can have Horrific. And again, I'm not a lot of people absolutely need to be on statins. Again, th this is not my expertise. This is not my area, but you can have major side effects. So why not explore natural options for that and the other things? But going back to the cash pay piece, I understand in America and in, 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 and in Canada, our people are absolutely used to everything being paid for. Now we have deductibles. And now in America, deductibles are a lot more of a problem than they are in Canada. We have very different systems. Mm -hmm. But but the 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 old over, you know, the overlying and overarching theme that I'm trying to get out there is if you're getting something for free, okay, but it is not improving your health, who cares? I don't care if the, the neighbor next door gives me his broken down car and he, and it's free. He's like, you know what? I have 20 of these things. I, I'm just going to give them to you. Or, Hey, you know, uh, why don't you take over my home? We're moving out. And you go in there and, and right, and it's a disaster. The roof is leaking. Everything's about to fall down. It, it's just a disaster. Why? It doesn't matter whether or not it's free. If it's free and it's getting you to where you need to be with your health and you're getting all the preventative stuff and the lifestyle management, all these things, amazing. Mm -hmm. But if it's not getting you to where you are, then right. it's more about where are you putting your health care dollars to work? Your right. And when I say your health care dollars, stop with it's just your dollars. OK, people are willing to go to ball games with their family. Right. These are my patients. They'll yeah. take their they'll take their family to a twins game. And after tickets, they'll get great tickets sometimes. And then they'll buy, you know, their hot dogs and all this other stuff that is probably not great for them anyway. But it's fine if it's just the one time, whatever. I'm not here yeah. to pick. Have a good time. Have a good time at the ball game. America's pastime, whatever. But the bill for a family of four, if you really go all out and you get your kids every every candy they want and everything, and you're drinking, you know, the, the the dad's drinking beers, whatever, drop seven eight hundred dollars on a baseball game if, for regular season. But yet, when patients are asked to spend seven or eight hundred dollars, you know, to have a month's worth of care with biohacking methods that literally can ch completely change their life, completely. Oh my God, I, I, this is ridiculous. Why is this not covered? I, I don't understand. Yeah. And so it's 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 about changing the mentality and not everybody, I get it. Some people are willing mm -hmm. to sell, they'll sell their house. You yeah. know, if, if you have Lyme's disease and you can't find treatment, yeah. you'll sell your house to get treatment. It, it doesn't matter. But for the vast majority of people that just don't feel well or they're sick or they, they're, they're on all these medications, they're not getting help. They need to start understanding where do you allocate your dollars? No one's stealing anything from you. You're not being ripped off. You're, in fact, it's the opposite because you're investing in your own health. That is so much more important honestly than buying that brand new car you know that 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 you really don't need why don't you invest in your health because then right it might you might advance in your career
you mm. might be able to go back to work. You mm. might have so much help with your mental health. Yeah. Instead of buying one new car, you might end up buying 20 new cars because all of a sudden, all these dreams and goals you had, you can get back to them because you're healthier. Your mind, your health is your wealth, right? So you can you can get back to all these things. We have to imprint this into, I, I, I want to just put this in, I think we just need a chip. Maybe Elon's Neuralink will just, we just push a button and this just goes in there. So they get it. I don't know. How to, I, I mean, like, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. I have nothing to do with Neuralink, by the way. So everyone's, <laughs> everyone's like, oh my God, the monkeys. And the, it's okay. It's okay. It's, we're just having a conversation. Everyone relax. It's okay. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, that that's the thing. It's like, when I first wrote the brochure for our wellness centers, I, I did this one paragraph and it just talked about what is the purpose of any material wealth, of any advancement in your career, of anything, if you don't feel good. It, 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 what If you cannot have a normal conversation with your child without thinking about your headache or your fatigue or your brain fog, if you just don't even want to be doing anything that you're doing because you don't feel well on a daily basis, who cares if you're making a lot of money? Who, it doesn't matter. So we need to think about how do the, the, we get those people to understand that they need to make an investment in in you know in their own health. Sorry to go on a big diatribe yeah, yeah. on this whole thing, but it's it, it it could not be more important. And I know that's your message. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it is hard, and I think in many ways too. On some level, I mean, when you're sick, sick is one thing, but we tend to normalize to a lot of yes. how we feel, right? And and that's what I see every day with cortisol dysregulation is that we normalize, well, we normalize our stress. And in and, and actual fact, we often wear stress as a badge of honor too, right? That that I'm I'm going hundred miles an hour and I'm yes. so busy and, and all this sort of stuff. And but you know what what we really are failing to recognize is that there is a consequence to chronic stress. And just because everybody else is going 150 miles an hour doesn't mean that that's actually you know working for you or just because you've always gone 150 miles an hour but all of a sudden the wheels are falling off um yeah because it's it's catching up with you there is a physiologic consequence to all of this so i think there's a lot of people too that are not feeling great they may not be at the extremes of disease but they're sitting in this middle ground you know saying things like well yeah i'm tired today because i didn't sleep last night okay but why didn't you sleep last night <laughs> Right. And, yeah. and if you, you know, you just have to keep asking the questions why. And, and oftentimes there's a physiologic underpinning to it all, but there's so much of the mind spirit that gets dragged into it too. Right. And that's another big yes. piece that, you know, when we, when we look at medicine, we're really only thinking of the physical body. Well, that's kind of short sighted. Um, if you think of the impact that how we think matters. Yeah. You know, it's again, Every time you say anything, it, it it just it just an explosion of of things because honestly, these these topics that we're talking about, they're so broad that mm -hmm. each one of them is is hours of, of 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 talking about it. But you absolutely talk about the mind spirit connection, the emotional, the spiritual, the healing. I am a massive proponent of things like meditation, breath work, all these other things, which I, I I'm sure you're you're into all that stuff as well. But the beauty is, is that science is now catching up to a lot of these things and looking at functional MRIs and, you know, meditating monks and all these other things. Dr. Joe Dispenza is a guy that, you know, mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm really hoping to get him on my podcast because mm -hmm. he, he doesn't know it, but he is one of my mentors. It's funny when people are your mentors and they, they just don't kind of know it. But anyway, um, looking at the science behind why people can heal thyself just by their thoughts alone. And I going back to again to myself two years ago and if i could talk to myself two years ago my two years ago self would laugh at me today because now i'm posting things about releasing by our thoughts the hormones of love instead of the hormones of stress you know think talking about like you know oxytocin and all these other you know amazing things and then not releasing you know the hormones of 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 being attacked by a tiger 24 hours a day and we're living in those states because we're going 100 miles you know we're going 100 miles an hour we never stop we never put our phones down we got a million things we wear it as a badge of honor and we're and we're getting sicker and sicker by it so the mind body connection could not be more important and I, i'm really trying to get out there and there i will say that a lot of people like in the neurology fields and the psychiatric fields are really starting to catch on and i've had some amazing guests on on, on my show talking about these things. And, and sometimes it sounds like touchy feely, 
but it's not. It's it's really based on on hardcore science, right? Because you're getting into these parasympathetic states, and that's leading to an explosion of good things happening. Whereas, okay. right, if I'm always afraid that you know, like some country's spying on me and they're watching me with a satellite, and I'm always living in fear and paranoid, and I'm upset with my fa and I'm always upset and going 100 miles an hour. That's the opposite. Then it's an explosion of things that that not only make us not feel well, but get us physically, physiologically, as you say, ill. And mm -hmm. that is the root of a lot of chronic diseases and it all plays into the lifestyle. So we have to have the hard things like the nutrition, diet, all that stuff, but you also have the 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 mental you know, aspect, the spiritual aspect, you know, and it all comes together, all comes together. To, yeah. to give this, you know, th this amazing, just the benefits and we both experienced it because we do a lot of this stuff but when i see people like come some there are patients that now have been treating in our wellness centers that have been my patients for years on the spine surgery front some of them i've done surgery on some of them have not literally some of them are making appointments to see me and i know you see this every day and 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 i'm kind of jealous because you get to do this on a, on a daily basis <laughs> i mean they they make appointments to see me as a spine surgeon to hug to give to hug for hugs and it's like a whole teary thing and it's like oh my god you changed my life by by just putting these things on my radar and changing right, my right. diet and and putting so cool. breath work and then doing the photobiomodulation and all these other things that we teach and and it's i know that that there's nothing, uh, there's not a better feeling. Now, obviously I love it when I do a spine surgery on somebody and they come in and I, you change my life. Now I can walk, right. I can play with my kids and things like that. But it is amazing now to see it on the, on the wellness side, you know, and what, what we can do, you know, for, for these people. I, I think that what we, you know, what I'd love for you to, to talk about without getting into, you know, the purpose of the, of these shows, because the audience just wants to know like, like who you are, what they should be doing, like what, like what, what's changing? Like, why are these two so excited about, you know, the stuff they're talking about? But I think we should talk a little bit about burnout and, and, and adrenal fatigue syndrome and how cortisol plays into all that. And we could talk a little bit about, you know, hormonal health. Can you talk about physiologically what happens in burnout and and how you know you we can treat it from a functional medicine aspect. So just mm -hmm. give us a little kind of mini course on yeah. on what is burnout, what is what is adrenal fatigue syndrome, and how, mm -hmm. how do we all process this stuff? Yeah. So cortisol is our stress hormone, and it's meant to help us manage with our stress. The problem is, is that the system can be on overload, and it can be on overload not just because of the obvious emotional and psychological stressors, which of course is what we think of when we say stress but physical stressors as well. So things like infections, inflammation, food sensitivities, environmental toxins, right? So all of those, the body will see as stressors and has to cope with it. And so if it's under chronic stress and ongoing and it's you know not, not letting up, in many ways, stress is additive and it's cumulative. So we're carrying forward, particularly additive and cumulative if we're not addressing the mind-spirit aspect of healing and changing, making those, those shifts yes. that we need to. So we're basically constantly calling on cortisol. And so if it gets pushed too far, you get into the territory of dysregulation. And when cortisol is dysregulation, it will show up in a whole bunch of different ways, but there does seem to be sort of a typical pattern and progression and fatigue being probably the most common. And what people will experience is an afternoon slump. So there, there's a perfect example of how we've normalized that. Everybody sort of expects to have that afternoon three to four yes. uh, PM slump, right? But if if you're going full tilt, um, meaning the system is operating at, at full yes. uh, capacity, then you don't have an afternoon slump. It's also, you know, you tend to get that, you know, little zip in energy after that. And then you start getting sleepy too early in the evening. So 7.30, 8 o'clock, you're falling asleep on the couch. And right, but it's too, it's still too early to go to bed yet. So you push through. And then all of a sudden you get your second wind and you're up till, you know, 12, yes. 12 to one, <laughs> one, right? And then not only that, but then you get into this very typical um, classic sleep disruption between two and 4 a.m. And then the pattern keeps going, right? So you, and, and that, if you're not getting restorative sleep, well, yes, that obviously you're fatigued the next day, but you're fatigued because of a physiologic pattern, right? So cortisol is meant to, it's part of what wakes us up in the morning. And then you've got this nice gradual slow, uh, you know, uh, decline throughout the rest of the day. And it's supposed to be at its lowest overnight, but people have the craziest patterns. I mean, you could be firing off cortisol in the middle of the night um, as though you're running away from a bear that doesn't exist. Yes. 
right? So a fatigue pattern is, is pretty typical. Um, the sleep disruption um, is pretty typical. Um, hot flashes are actually pretty common. So, and that gets confusing for women. They have a hot flash. They assume that it's a low estrogen issue when oftentimes um, it's a cortisol and cortisol hot flashes are actually much easier to identify than a low estrogen hot flash. So um, a hot flash that, that sort of happens as you first wake up in the morning um, throughout the day, there's usually something that triggers it. So a stressful event, caffeine, hot, spicy foods, alcohol, and then overnight again, you get that two to 4 a.m hot flashes, that's classically cortisol, whereas a low estrogen tends to be willy-nilly. Those hot flashes are all over the place. Mood. Mood is another big piece. So when you have a cortisol dysregulation, it actually impacts the gastrointestinal tract. And when it impacts the gastrointestinal tract, we get into maldigestion, malabsorption, we get into a leaky gut, and that whole cascade leads to um, an amino acid deficiency. So we get our amino acids from our protein, but proteins are also the hardest food complex to break down, right? So if you're if you've got maldigestion, malabsorption, and you're not breaking down proteins, you're just not getting the bang for your buck out of your food, as one example. And you break them down into the amino acids, and then their body takes those amino acids and rebuilds them into well every protein in our body, which is pretty much everything. So if you're having difficulty breaking down and absorbing because of an underlying cortisol issue, and you're burning through your amino acids at great speeds because you have a cortisol issue, right? It's a ramped up yes. catabolic state. Then you, you've you got this net deficit, which translates to the whole point of me focusing on amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks for our brain neurotransmitters. So we get into anxiety and depression and irritability and overwhelm and just not coping in the way that we're used to coping. So it can be, again, on a whole spectrum of, you know, mm -hmm. to, you know, lashing out because, you know, somebody's an idiot right or you know to the next level where everybody's an idiot <laughs> right um, and then on to things like anxiety and depression and so so mood tends to be a big big part of cortisol dysregulation as well um weight management yes right and that midsection weight gain uh, particularly if it's the fluff above the muscle that tends to be more of a cortisol um issue so you know the 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 symptoms of it are are pretty widespread um, and then how you manage it is it's a little bit more complicated because again, we've got this whole mind, body, spirit aspect going in. So you have to ask your question, how did I get here in the first place? Yes. Right. And so you can do all sorts of, you know, physical body protocols and, and you do, and sometimes you have to do that first just to get people into a headspace where they can actually make change. But when they're in that position, then you, then you have to really look at yourself and look in the mirror and ask you know, how am I showing up? And is, am I showing up in a healthy way? And I think women, you know, in particular, we are, there's a couple of things that we, we do and we all know we do it. And, you know, and it's easy enough to kind of laugh in an appointment, but the reality is like, we tend to be control freaks. We tend to want to control a lot of things, but we are also trying to control the things that we can't control, right? So we can invest a lot of energy and in spinning our wheels, trying to make change for something that we just simply have to surrender to. And surrender doesn't mean you, you don't take action. Surrender just means, you know, like jump in the river and go with the flow. Why are you trying to swim upstream yes, for something yes. that you can't change anyway? Right. And I think, you know, that's a really, and by the way, that is not just a, well, it is, it is a bit of an aha moment for some, but it's also practiced. You can't just say, yeah, from here on out, I'm going to surrender and I'm not going to worry about the things that I can't control. Yes. The, rea the reality is, is that you, you do have to um, take it each time it comes your way and, you know, letting it go. And then all of a sudden, just like anything else, it becomes a habit. And so you don't have to keep practicing it any, anymore. So that's what I mean by addressing sort of the, the, you know, renewal of the mind piece yes. of it, you know, understanding, you know, what you're surrendering, who you're surrendering it to, that's, you know, can tie into the whole spiritual aspect of it. Um, and then there's the physical body and the physical body. It, it's really, again, it's, it's nothing fancy. It's understanding the, the basics and the deficiencies. And this is where some of the testing gets really cool. Like we can tell somebody's amino acid deficiencies down yes. to the five milligram increment, right? So we can custom formulate, you know, if there's, you know, anxiety or depression or, you know, having some of the, the um, serum markers for vitamins and minerals and, yes. and nutrients. Well, the system's not going to run 
efficiently if you don't have the basic building blocks for it to run efficiently with. Um, I think that's actually one of the bigger things in medicine that we have completely overlooked is the value of some of these basic building blocks. In fact, oftentimes it gets dismissed, but I mean, you and I know as a surgeon, right? How's the body going to heal if it doesn't, you know, we, we get told that our scars look, you know, your scar looks great. Thank you, doctor. <laughs> yeah. You know, short of making a straight line. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> right. The body, the body's going to heal the way it's going to heal because it's got what it needs to heal. And uh, you know, I'm a big fan. And I don't know what I would do without this particular tool, but intravenous vitamin and nutrient therapy. Yes. Right. So it's yes. it's just flooding the body with a ton of the good stuff: vitamin C, magnesium, your Bs, your amino acids. But the root of administration intravenously means that you can bypass the gut which I just mm -hmm. explained, right? There's a lot of issues with maldigestion, malabsorption when you have an underlying cortisol issue. So when you bypass the gut, you get 100% bioavailability at the cellular level. So there's lots of uh, ways to target the micronutrients. And of course, there's all sorts of herbal remedies that you can use to help people you know, bridge the gap, whether it's to keep them asleep at night, get them off to sleep, um, calm them down during the day, whatever. Those are tools meant to buy some time while you are setting the foundation and getting that more established. So, you know, there's lots of things, the extremes of disease, you know, you can, of course, give cortisol, yeah. but, you know, we even know in conventional medicine, you do your absolute very best not yes. to put somebody on that. And so I don't, I, you know, I can think of maybe three times in the last 10 years where oh. somebody has been that unwell, you want to work very hard at getting the body to heal itself when it comes to this cortisol dysregulation. It's a little bit different. Estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, um, you know, those are hormones that we do tend to replete. Um, and bring back, you know, to a physiologic mm -hmm. range um, and achieving balance with that. But, and that, that can cortisol, by the way, <clears throat> it undermines and touches every other system in the body when it goes off. Right. So, you know, yes. you've heard me already talk about the gut and brain neurotransmitters, but it undermines the sex hormone production as well. You know, so you see it ties into thyroid. So it yes. just, it touches everything. So from a hormonal perspective, um, if you're really are going to get at the root of the matter and make a difference, you've got to get it cortisol. It's it's a foundational hormone. And if you don't figure that one out, you're chasing your tail with absolutely every other hormone, every other system to boot. So it's a, it's a really, really key hormone, but it's also the hormone that when people um, get better and they've done it right and they've addressed that mind spirit aspect of it, that's where they get well and they stay well. Yes. Right. But it has such far reaching implications um, beyond just how you feel in this moment, too. That's the hormone that you really want to address if you're going to, you know, talk about prevention from high blood pressure, diabetes, cancers. Mm -hmm. Right. It, uh, it's a it's an amazing hormone because it's really meant to keep us alive. But keeping us alive can sometimes be done at, at the expense of feeling crappy. So if or, we can get, yeah, or worse. <laughs> or, or killing us because, I mean, we have, you know, I talk about the the chronic disease problem that we have, you know, in westernized countries and and you you guys struggle with it the same that we struggle with it. It's, 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 it's insane. And lifestyle choices and, and all those things that you talk about make a dramatic difference in your cortisol levels. And when you were talking about the cortisol levels, think just random stuff always pops into my, into my head. That's why I love doing this so much. But I can think of, you know, I think this would be a great like Black Mirror episode where every human on the planet walks around with their cortisol level like over their head on on like a pop up yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. and then you know, and then people just kind of know it, you know, who's sick and who's not. But it's it's funny, and you know, you know this experience, especially now that that you've kind of seen the light and 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 you've dedicated your entire career to this. When you start thinking about these issues. As a physician, any provider, just people that are really into it, I can go to the gym, right? People go to the gym. They think that, you know, doing six biceps curls and then they walk on the treadmill for three minutes, that that's not, that is not a health and wellness program and strategy. And then they're at McDonald's, right? Right after that or or whatever. But we can walk around anywhere and I can, and you, you can at least, not every, not all the time, but certainly the people that are a cortisol mess, yeah. Right. That they're just, oh, yeah. oh my God. I, 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 right now I just picture myself at the gym, looking at the treadmills being like massively high cortisol, massively. Oh, great. Good cord. Horrible. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and, and it's just, it's so obvious it's right in front of our faces, mm -hmm. but yet addressing it is complex. It's multimodal and all those things you said, it's honestly, and, and it's not, it's obvious, but it's not easy unless you make these changes are willing to accept, see people like you that really understand how cortisol plays into thyroid, protect, whatever, and seven minute visits 
You, you can't. You, what do you even? I don't even know what you talk about in seven, ten minutes, even fifteen minutes. You can't even right. get to the heart of anything. It's different what I do. If somebody has a, a, a horribly compressed nerve, I, I need about twenty-three seconds to say, mm -hmm. "Well, your foot's not working. <laughs> your nerves crushed. We probably should take that out. That's a good right. indication for surgery." I don't need an hour. But if if somebody comes in and says, "Yeah, doc, I I just don't feel well." That's not a that's not a 15 minute discussion. That's yeah. labs and hours and maybe getting quantitative EEGs and just looking at their entire all their systems and how they're, you know, all interacting and working. So thanks. That was a, that was an the, the outstanding kind of overview of how important cortisol is in the whole system. If you would say, listen, we all know there's not a one size fits all, but again, a lot of our audience, they, they, no one's talked to them about cortisol before. They maybe vaguely heard it. They're like, oh yeah, that's a hormone of stress. That's all they know. Mm -hmm. What would be, what's, what's a standard and listen, I, I know there, there is no standard, but what, what would be kind of the, the standard things that you want to fix Mm -hmm. cortisol if you if you could only okay let, i'll put it this way if you could only fix three things you just didn't have all you didn't have all your tools in the toolbox what are the three things that you would do to 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 at least put them in the right direction on fixing their cortisol problem yeah yeah well i think that surrender piece that i i mentioned is really it's very key you know guys um you know if we could compare it we've all seen the memes where the the brain of a woman is all you know, spaghetti and interconnected and the guys is very compartmentalized. There really is something to that. Yes. There's beauty in the compartmentalized brain because, you know, for me treating men, I love treating men. They get better like that because part of it is that they can put, you know, whatever they need to put, they can put it in its place and it's done and it's squared away and great. And I think there's a lot of beauty in that. I also think there's a lot of beauty in a woman's brain because I think we do experience our world in a, in a very different way, but it's very complicated. And- yes. And I think if if women, if we could learn to do a little bit more compartmentalization, and, I, and that doesn't mean ignoring an issue or anything like that. It just means putting it where it belongs. And if we can't control it, we can't control it. Don't invest any energy into it. I think that's a really key you know, piece. Mm, and it kind of goes along with delegation too. Those two things sort of go hand in hand because women like to uh, run the show. And but it does, it's not necessarily healthy for them. And so if you can, you know, trust somebody else to take over some of what you're doing, um, then that takes some of the pressure off. And that's a form, that's a form of surrendering in many, in many ways. Yes. Right. Um, so I think that's, that's a really key way of slowing the process down. Don't normalize your stress. It's, you know, asking yourself some of the questions like, why do I, you know, feel the need to do a job 150%. Like, why do I think that way? Or why do I feel that I have to go full tilt and juggle, you know, 10 balls at the same time? And, and oftentimes when we ask that question, it's kind of interesting where, you, you know, where it is. I mean, oftentimes it's our families have, have taught us to do it that way. Culturally, we are taught to do it that way. But who says it has to be done that way? And in actual fact, what I found personally, if I look at myself 10 years ago, and I would have said that I was really good at, you know, multitasking, you know, balls in the air, but I was starting to drop them too. So now um, I'm way more efficient than what I was before and happier for it. Yes. Right. So I think, you know, that whole aspect of it is, is really very key uh, to at least slow the process down. I always, always describe to my patients, I think is a great analogy. We're all leaky buckets. Just yes. some of us are leakier than others. And there are periods of time when we are, you know, leakier than we are at other times. And so when we're trying to fill that physical bucket and get somebody feeling better, part of that is trying to identify where are the holes in your leaky bucket, mm -hmm. right? And as I say, th those can be the emotional psychological holes that, um, you know, and surrendering and delegation and all that sort of stuff is, but physical stressors to the body, identifying infections, inflammation, food sensitivities, environmental toxins, that's an effective way. And then when it comes to actually filling the bucket, you know, nutrition is key. Sleep is key. Yes. Exercise is key. The only thing I would say is that you have to be really careful when you've got an advanced cortisol dysregulation, which is where your cortisol levels have actually gone yes. low, you can actually over-exercise. Right. And this is where people get stuck in that loop from a weight management perspective. They think that they have to restrict their calories um, and up their exercise. And and although I love intermittent fasting as well, I'm a big fan of intermittent fasting. There, that's one exception is when somebody is yes, yes, advanced absolutely. cortisol dysregulation, because yes. the body will see that as yet additional stressors and it hangs on to the weight even more. So that would be I don't know, you know, what number I'm at now. But if I were to say, you know, number three. 
is really about being good to yourself. And that includes, you know, good food, good nutrition um, is sometimes, I think some places it's harder to come by than others, but we all, you know, if it's, if it comes out of the ground or off a tree or, you know, it's probably, probably pretty good for you. Yes. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, the sleep part of it, I get that a lot of people will struggle with sleep disruption, but there's also a lot of sort of basic things that we should be doing as, as a starting point to make sure that we're getting a good night's sleep. And beyond that, then, you know, um, looking for other reasons can be really important. You know, going out for a walk around the block, getting fresh air, light, malillumination, right? I mean, you know, with, yes. with the work that you're doing, that's a big problem. Um, you know, the, the bare feet on the ground, Yes. I've got my PMF mat. I've got my infrared, yes. my, right? I've got all of that. And yet at, yet at the same time, if we just go outside first thing in the morning, you know, get your, yes. get your sunlight, get your bare feet and ground. And, um, you know, there's a lot of really simple things that aren't expensive that we can do that can actually shift. And it sounds silly, but it's amazing what can happen when you, when you really put some effort into self-care. No, that, that was, no, that's, that, that's absolutely brilliant. And, it, it's so interesting. You, you just bring up a lot of things. So because I'm 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 in the process of writing this book, and I talk to people all the time about it, and and I have confidants, and 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 we kind of you know it, it, you just go back and forth, and they always say, you know, I've always been asked, you know, you're into all this longevity and biohacking, you know, and why don't you want to put more really detailed stuff into some of the the posts I do and, and things like that? I think that that space in kind of in podcasting and social media in, in, in just in media in general it is well taken. The David Asprey's of the world and all these people, brilliant, brilliant people, Mark, Heim, they're, they're brilliant people. And but in some ways, I feel that when you start talking about how we methylate the drugs that we take in and genetic testing and all these other things, yes, that's reserved to when they come to an integrative health clinic and then they can be offered all these different things. But as far as you know, podcasts like we're doing today and getting information out, think about where people are even starting. I mean, to, to talk to my patients about hardcore biohacking and being on 19 different supplements. I mean, some of these hardcore, bio, like the super hardcore biohack take the 30, 30 pills a day. I mean, they're going crazy because they want to live to 130 years old and power to them. I hope they make it to 160. That's great. My patients don't understand that a big gulp at 730 in the morning when they're sitting there for, you know, my first patient visit, 96 ounces, they don't understand that that is going to kill them. Mm -hmm. We need to start at that. And, and your answers, your three things, so simple. Let's just start at that. We got to get this information out. And then we, we we have the building blocks on top of that. Then we start adding some of the hormonal management. We we start looking at all these different things, which absolutely, I mean, a huge, I mean, this is, this is the future. This is how we have to treat patients. This is where medicine needs to go. But everything you said, those, those, those three things that you said are so critical for people just to be good to themselves, you know, to just, just to, to just have an open mind and, and understand why are they, you know, you know, why are they so stressed? Half the time, if you ask people, why are you going so hard? Why are you so stressed out? Why? They don't even know because they haven't spent time alone. They haven't meditated. They haven't done breath work. They haven't paused. We don't yep. pause anymore. We don't put our phones down. We never stop. We're answering 90 texts and then doing this and that, and then dealing with our kids who are also stressed. And then, and then that stresses us out. And it's a 24 hour cycle. You know, the news used to be, you just put the news on, you watch it for an hour and that's your news, or you read the newspaper on Sunday morning and you catch up on the week. Now it's a 24 hour loop. We're in yeah. this crazy political season now here in the United States. People can't turn off. They cannot turn it off. Everything is just blown out of proportion. And cortisol levels during political season, we need to study this because it's yeah. it's way worse, right? It's even worse. Yeah. Or anytime yeah. a major tragedy happens or 9-11, cortisol levels yeah. go off the chart because yeah. it, you know, it adds on to that. So thank you for that. Uh, like just amazing answer because honestly, that's as simple as it needs to be. This is what people need to be hearing. Mm -hmm. It's like you got to change your lifestyle. Turn it off. Go out in nature, walk barefoot. It's it's all, you know, just just amazing stuff. I want to get back to, you know, some of this you talked about before, and, and I talk about all this time. What what 
conventional medicine is bad at is that in between. You just say, yeah, there's some people that are really sick. Okay, they, they need help. They need to be on 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 cortisol, which again is a last last resort, or they need to have surgery, last resort, or they should be on all these all these drugs. Should absolutely be last resort, and 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 things are going there. Psychiatry is going there. Neurology is going there. Medicine should be last resort. Not. It's not broad enough, but there are plenty of people, you know, pushing this stuff. But when we think about that middle ground, my favorite word, okay, and, and thing is, is the word disease, mm -hmm. okay? When people think of disease, they think of, I have cancer, I have, you know, I have diabetes, I have this and that. Think about that word, dis-ease. We are not at ease. And what percentage, honestly, if we, here's, here's a one, you know how we have these huge surveys. We have all these different questionnaires we use and everything. How about one question? Do you feel at ease at this moment? Mm -hmm. What are this percentage of the population that's going to say, oh, I, I feel I'm so relaxed right now. I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm floating. I'm floating on a cloud of all these ideas. I want to. Uh, no, the vast majority of our, if this moment we just called, you know, a hundred thousand people and said, do you feel at ease right now? You know what the, you, we know what the answer yeah. is going to be. Yeah. No, yeah. it's that in between that that's where we need to really target because this is millions and millions and millions of people or they have low level and they have low level chronic disease. They're metabolically unhealthy. I'm sure you're familiar with the studies, right? Less than 10% of our population is really metabolically healthy. Yeah. And that's yeah. shocking. But yet yeah. I ask all my, I ask my patients all the time. Are you healthy? Oh yes, doctor. I'm yeah. extraordinarily healthy. Yeah. Like, I, I can't even answer that, but, <laughs> or, or I don't have high blood pressure. Okay. But then what's the blood pressure medication for? Yeah. Like I don't have, yeah, but you're on three of them. <laughs> not only do you not, I mean, but, and you also have renal disease and whatever. Yeah. But isn't that great? Like disease, disease. Yeah. Honestly, most of us are sick. Our population is sick. We are diseased. There's levels of it. I love it that you just called it out. It's that in-between state. It's that limbo state. When we are children, when we're seven years old and we're wearing our Batman or our, you know, Supergirl costumes mm -hmm. or whatever you, whatever people want to, you know, want to be, it's people do crazy stuff. I love Halloween because they have all the, you just kind of can tell like what kids want to be. But when we're doing that, do, do you, like, do you think that like 10 year olds go around being like, you know what? When I'm 30, 40, 50, 60, 7 years old, I'm just going to live a life where I feel like crap all the time. I'm just going to be unhappy and I'm going to hate everyone and everyone's a jerk and I just can't stand it and the world is is this is this what it is? Is this what we're doing? And this is why this stuff that we're talking about today I can't be more passionate about it cuz if we can help if even just one two people, five people that watch this show right. It changes their life just because they're like, you know what? I'm going to make an appointment with whoever. And I'm just going to, I'm going to look at it as a different way. Or, you know what? I'm going to be nice to myself. Or, you know what? I'm not going to juggle all these things anymore. It doesn't even make sense. I don't even want to be juggling half of it anyway. It doesn't even do anything. What am I doing right. it for? Because, because my grandma's pressuring me to do, I mean, come on. Yeah. It's just because somebody wants me to live this life. That's not even me. Like, yeah. what, what are we, what are, what are we doing? So, I mean, it, it, I, I'm sure that resonates with you, this whole disease thing. And, and yeah. I'm probably 90% of the people that come see you, they're like, I'm not at ease. I can't do this anymore. This sucks. I yeah. cannot do this. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, a brilliant takeaway is it actually doesn't have to be this way. It, it just, it, it just does not have to be this way. And there's so many tools that you're providing to people so that it's not that way. So they are at ease so that when they sit with their children or their or their parents or their colleagues, they're happy. They don't see everybody as an enemy or, you know, that, or, 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 or being a jerk or everything they say is annoying. Right. And that's the state. Right. When you're in, when you're burnt out at literally everything anyone could say, unless they say the most perfect thing, everything is annoying. Right. That's when you are it. You got to we got to yeah. we got to make some, you know, some changes. Yeah. So, be, you know, before I just, you know, we, we, we've covered so many things, but one of the the, the, the kind of the last bucket of, of topics that I want to cover, and it's, it's just all under one bucket is just I have a couple things. I, first, I want to talk about the science of it and, and, and recommendations and things like that, because obviously we don't have time to go through every hormonal panel and what what to do about it. But I want to talk about that, and I want to talk about then some of the stigma. 
because stigma is a problem in many, many conditions, psychiatric care, woman's care. I mean, there's a lot of stigma out there. And then there's no room for stigma. We just have to, to heal disease, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I want to talk about the, the testosterone management because it is a big one. And one, I get questions. I mean, I've been getting questions about testosterone management before. I didn't even, didn't even know anything about it. And people are asking me because they're like, Hey doc, should I, you know, like, should I go see my, you know, my, my OBGYN or should I see my, you know, urologist or, or family doctor and, and get on some hormones? I don't feel well. Like I don't, I don't <laughs> feel good. And there, and there's a lot of, you know, different stigmas and stuff that goes along with some of that stuff. But can you talk about the recommendations? And I know it's, not it's not about yes. just focusing on one thing but can you talk about recommendations in women and in men what what are the actual guidelines that somebody could look up on google and what's the truth about testosterone especially in women because that I, and now that i ha have become you know so close with so many people in the in the in the obgyn field i know so much more about it and and when i ask them that question some people get like they go on just just tirades about misconceptions especially women and testosterone levels yeah yeah testosterone is a lovely hormone but i think also it gets too much, I don't want to say too much credit, but too much emphasis perhaps on, on cortisol, uh, sorry, on testosterone. Yeah, so yeah. first and foremost, no different in the Canadian market than it would be in the American market. We only have testosterone dosing that is appropriate for men. So right there out of the gates, right? We don't have the lower doses of hormones that are required for women unless they are custom compounded. Yes. Right. And that's, that's certainly one way of going about it. But what I would say is that you have to have the symptoms of low testosterone, which goes along with decreased libido, you know, declining muscle mass, et cetera, et cetera and objective evidence that your testosterone is actually low. Yes. And the reason why you want that objective evidence is because nine times out of 10, what sounds like a low testosterone based on your symptoms, and this is men or women, is actually an underlying cortisol issue. So yes. cortisol dysregulation absolutely will impact on libido. It's a catabolic hormone. So it tears down muscles, yada, 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 right? So I think that's really important to, to know is that you've got to have the symptoms that match with the low testosterone and objective evidence that testosterone is low. And then when it goes to treating, absolutely one size does not fit all. And there's a perfect yes. example. You're not going to give a woman male doses of uh, <laughs> testosterone, right? Uh, yeah. We need a fraction. But the idea is, um, if it is indeed low, is to return somebody to the physiologic range. So, you know, for me, that might be a little bit. And for, you know, the next woman, it might be that much more. It depends on how deplete we are to begin with. Yes. And you'll see this whole spectrum. The other thing that I've found curious over the years is as a gynecologist, we were always taught that testosterone levels drop with menopause. Um, what I've actually found is it really only seems to drop when there's an underlying cortisol issue. And that actually makes sense from a physiologic standpoint, yes. because if you're dumping, you know, and your body's putting efforts into making cortisol, it will do so at the expense of some of the other hormones. And testosterone is actually one that commonly takes a hit. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a great, again, a great tool to have in the toolbox. I do use it all the time. I use other hormones that also trickle down yes. into DHEA. So I don't, it's, DHEA can trickle down into testosterone. So I don't sometimes even have to give testosterone. Um, so it really depends on the bigger picture, how you can treat somebody, but you can boost testosterone by trickle down effect, by obviously giving yep. testosterone or giving a supplement that supports testosterone. But once again, if you really want to get at an underlying testosterone issue, you want to deal with the cortisol. Yep. So when you, so I, 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 have a, I have a, so when you are seeing somebody for the first time, if their testosterone levels, and again, we, we got to be careful with, with which organization and body you're, you're looking at, because like endocrinologists look at it very different than kind of what the family, pro it, it, it's just, it's interesting. And I don't know if it's the same in Canada, if it's all based, but it really specialists look at l these things different. But when you're looking at it, if they're, if they're somewhat low, male or female in testosterone, do you try to fix their cortisol first before any supplementation, or do you just kind of roll it all out in once? Because Honestly, I've, I've talked. I talk to a lot of people because these are, you know, things that that are, you know, uh, OB, you know, guy folks are going to be, you know, you know, doing, and and they have different. Everyone has a kind of a different. I think it's all right. It's all roads to the same, you know, yeah. goal. 
least everyone's identifying it. But do yeah. you think that maybe trying to just fix test like cortisol levels by 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 some of these things we talked about, like fixing the mind, fixing the diet, fixing the sleep patterns, and then rechecking testosterone levels before supplementing them if they're just a little bit low or is it something where we should be putting them in the physiologic range right away because they're gonna because it, it does i mean you see people when they and i and i'll give you a good exam i give you a good example here one after after you know your answer but or do we just get them because they feel better you know, right away. Some people like real, if they're low and you, and you fix it, then yeah. they're already better, but you still, but that doesn't mean they don't need to fix their cortisol problem too yeah. for a long-term yeah. fix. So the answer really, it depends. And I, because I've been doing it as long as I've been doing it and I can look at results and I know what kind of correction we're going to get from addressing the cortisol. If I think you know, a, a, is it really testosterone in the first place? Well, then let's focus on the cortisol because nine times out of 10, that corrects the issue anyway. But if it's a, if it's a subtle depletion in testosterone, then I would be more likely to work on cortisol mm -hmm. and then circle back because a lot of times, a lot, a lot of people don't want to be on something that they don't need to be on. And that makes complete sense yeah, to me, right? So if you, yeah. right. So if you can correct something from a more foundational level, then it may just end there as well. But there are some people and I can look at their testosterone and I, I can say, ah, you know what, I'm going to squeak a little bit out of this testosterone, but it's not going to return to the physiologic yes. range. Right. So, you know, that would be a scenario where, where you're giving it. The other part of that too, though, is if you're giving testosterone, you have to make sure that you've got adequate estrogen on board. So whether that's the, the, the um, individual's own estrogen levels are adequate, you know, yes. or whether you're, you're giving estrogen. And, and of course with men and women, you also, when you're giving testosterone have to be aware of how their body metabolizes testosterone into the estrogens and how does their body metabolize the estrogens, because you can put people in harm's way yes. as well of course. by, by giving a testosterone that isn't needed. Right. So, and it all, it really all comes back to, you know, when our own hormones are in balance and within the physiologic range, they don't give us a problem, but we can, correct for that yes but we can also create a problem when we're giving hormones yes right? so you can be giving too much yep. of one thing and not enough of the other and it causes what people will say is a side effect it's not a side effect it's a it's an imbalance of hormones it's a dosing dosing issue very rarely are people you know uh resistant or uh, sensitive to their own hormones it, it is a right. thing but you know usually it's an imbalance that's you know in there in the first place yeah, I mean, I think that, that that that's great, and I think for you know the purpose of this, that's a that's a that's a perfect answer, and people have to, and that's why it's so important for people to see experts that are really focused on kind of the totality of the situation, rather than just writing a script for one thing or another thing. Even in the in the integrative medicine, if all you're doing is is putting testosterone pellets in everybody, and that's 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 your you know that's the bright idea. That's one piece of a very very complicated puzzle. I mean, there's thousand. I mean, we talk about the main one, you know, cortisol, estrogen, testosterone, oxytocin, all all these things. Those are the, those are the main ones. The the some of the neurotransmitters. But everything like the, the your levels, like you talked about in amino acids all these different you know biomarkers that that we can look at they all interact with each other and that's why i like the concept of having a large amount of information yes some of it is not yes. not every single you know bit of information is going to be useful but a lot of it is because you can see the entire it, it, the entire picture you don't go to a museum right and and you go you don't go to an art museum and look and and, and if a, if a, if a painting is 10 by 10 you don't look at a one by one of it and say oh my god right. that's brilliant look at look at the artist did this is just mastery look at the but then and then you think of it it's something else and then it's you know it's a rembrandt it's not a whatever and so we have to look at the totality you know of what we're looking at just sticking on that you know briefly i, I there was a colleague that i ran into at a meeting and it, it in and I want to because I want to talk about the stigma. And it's interesting because this person is a physician, and he was telling me how much he's been struggling. And he's he's seen new. I mean, he has access to as many doctors as he's won, and he's seen a bunch of you know just regular his regular doctor you know, people he just saw, and and they weren't helping him right. They weren't doing and it and it's just it's funny because his testosterone level when it came back as a male was seventy. And he mm -hmm. said he was basically non-functional. So he was just starting on the treatments and already feeling better. Right. But he did bring up something. He said, you know, he, he brought up 
he asked a couple of, of the providers that he had seen about testosterone and if it's something he could, should look into, if they should even get, you know, titers. And he was told, no, you don't need that. They're, everyone's just doing that. That's that's not even a thing. Why, why are you looking mm -hmm. at that? Mm -hmm. You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so he felt like there was a stigma and that that actually prevented him from then even going down that route. He's oh. a, this is a physician that has access to whoever he wants. And it's right. so interesting to see the stigma. Now, the reason I bring him up and stigma is because in the, on the women's side, what I hear from a lot of providers that take care of females, and we have like amazing providers here in the state of Minnesota, like women's health is, is, a, is a big deal here. I'm sure it is in other states. I just happen to know it because, uh, you right. know, I'm starting to do, kind of go down that path too and, and and looking at some of these things and and they like almost all of them always want to talk about the stigma in women and hormones and just kind of just saying and and, it's, and the reason I bring testosterone not to whatever but this this misunderstanding that testosterone is for women that want to go into bodybuilding and not understanding how important that hormone is for yeah. for care and especially around perimenopausal times where you you've mm -hmm. got to fix all you got to fix cortisol and testosterone all these things mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. d d what do you like d and you don't see it as much because the people again they're coming to you specifically right they know they know where they're coming but but yeah. do you do you feel like there's still way too much stigma in in hormonal you know treatment like even the name of your 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 clinic this hormonal center i mean I can tell you, there's conventional doctors that still, they really, for I don't know why it bothers them. I don't know what it is about this stuff that's bothersome, but do you still see a lot of stigma, um, I th I especially in women? Than, yeah, I, I think right now we're in the midst of, um, I, I'm not sure where it's coming from. It's a great thing, but menopause, perimenopause is making yes. a big splash as it should, because it's, it's having significant impact even on our workforce. Right. And, yes. um, right. And, and it can be dismissed as just a, you know, a, a natural transition as it is, of course. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a whole lot of struggle that goes along with that. Right. So yeah, I, I'm glad that there is more attention being brought to that. And I think we are seeing things shift. Are we all the way there? No. I, and I think, you know, for example, you know, when, when I back in the day opened up the Institute for Hormonal Health and, you know, people would walk out with bags. I mean, we deliberately did not put our logo on the outside of it because who wants to walk, <laughs> walk around, you know, that's advertising exactly, that they were just at yeah. the Institute for Hormonal Health. Yes. Um, you know, that was something that I appreciated as a woman myself that I probably wouldn't want, you know, everybody to be aware of that. But <clears throat> things things are changing. And I think when people look at hormones within the bigger picture yes. is just part of health, um, there'll be far less um, stigma associated with it for sure. For sure. Yeah. And I think on the, on the perimenopausal piece, you know, the, the thing is absolutely in the mainstream, it's a big deal. I, you know, even though I do a lot of social media, I try to avoid being on social media too much because I have to, you know, I have to practice what I preach. So if I'm on social media all the yeah. time, I'm also my cortisol levels aren't going to be so so good either but there are so many great people talking about it i mean the royals are talking i mean the, all these people are talking about ah the stigma of of perimenopause and they're absolutely right because we need to really become aware of it because unfortunately there are many people many women but also men and in, in the whole hormonal thing their first contact point are i don't want to call them non-believers they're very traditional they don't they don't right. think that I've listened I've overheard conversations of doctors literally bashing patients for being on testosterone replacement. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, who put you on that? That's like malpractice, all this stuff. I, I, I just uh, yeah. whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa, let's let's like you, what you are really saying some some you don't even know uh, whatever. But yeah. yes, it's it's awesome to see it really out there. And you're right, the patients, people, the population is is driving it. Because the best way to drive something, guess what? If I'm doing some crazy thing and all of a sudden 20 people that are somebody start virally posting bad things about what I'm, and I'm, it's legitimately, I'm doing the wrong thing. Guess what? I, okay. It's on my radar. I get it. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I shouldn't be doing that. So I think that these things are like almost forcing it. And you said, watch out, like people better wake up. These mm -hmm. doctors that are not waking up to the things that we're doing today. Yeah, I get it today. You can get away with it. Fine. Do your mm -hmm. stuff, do your traditional stuff and, mm -hmm. and be in a silo. You keep doing this in 10 years, 
you, you, no one's going to come see you. I'm, I'm yeah. being honest. They, they're just yeah. not because they're going to know. They know. People eventually find out, right? The 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 the, the information's out there. It's 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 too readily, you know, accessible, you know, mm -hmm. and out there. Yeah. And so, you know, on that note, you know, it's been amazing really, you know, talking to you about all this stuff, I, you know, I, I, I could ask you another hundred questions, you know, if, if we had, I could, I could, this has been, this has been awesome. And we absolutely have to have a part two, because right. I, I think that, that there's some other issues that, that I'd love to get into some of which may be you know, even more controversial. And we, and we can talk about anything controversial, but right. there's nothing wrong with, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with con and it's not even controversial. You know, some of the things that were controversial just five years ago are mainstream. Exactly. Now. Exactly. And so it's okay to talk about some of the, the, these things, you know, some of the things, you know, that I talk about are, um, you know, I love to talk to, uh, and, and I haven't had enough of them on my podcast, but like energy healers and things like that. Mm -hmm. Listen, I understand that a lot of it maybe does not have the scientific backing and I will never get behind anything that doesn't really, but you know what, if it's just placebo, like you said before, mm -hmm. who cares? Yeah. Right. Yeah. If, if I, if we're getting if, better. Mm -hmm. They're getting better, and the mind is the most powerful healer of all. And yeah. so, if 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 that is if if that form of medicine is what gets them healed, you know, power absolutely, you know, power to them. So we could get into a little bit more, you know, more of these other things where yeah. you know, and I'll I'll get some pushback on that stuff. But I just say, listen, I'm not endorsing specifically yeah. anything. I'm just open minded enough and and listening. To what people are saying and then if you have thousands and thousands of people swearing by something it's doing something whether it's placebo Absolutely. it's real it's not and so yeah. i watched this video i'm not going to name the guy's name but it was uh, you talk about blood pressure and headaches and, and and cortisol levels going up there was this doctor on youtube that was talking to medical students and residents and I, honestly i i was going to invite him on my podcast because you know what sometimes you have to have combative shows and it's and it's okay yeah. he looked at the audience. These are impressionable young minds that are really trying to do well for the population. Yep. He looked at the audience and he told them functional medicine or anybody that uses functional medicine titles or integrative health or whatever is a scam. And they are just trying to scam you. I I don't know why a friend of mine sent me, I, 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 I have trouble without having any on and this guy was a surgeon mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay that yeah. that clearly doesn't understand but yeah. spent his entire lecture trying to debunk every single thing in in in, in functional medicine this was like seven eight years ago that would this be really really hard to do <laughs> i'm not sure how you well, could i mean you talk it. i mean and again and again yeah. when we talk about natural means i mean you you mentioned acupuncture and herbs and all these other things listen when you go to the shelves at CVS, or it's all popular. I mean, they're, they're going to be selling like supplements mm -hmm. at, at you yeah, know, yeah, every yeah. gas station pretty soon, right? You five hour energy you can get amino acids, all this stuff. Listen, I'll be the first person to say, absolutely are a large majority of those things, sugar pills. I don't want to call them sugar pills. They may, maybe they may mm -hmm. or may not have sugar. I don't, I don't want, I don't want to, I'm bashing them enough. We don't have to say they have sugar in it too. It's a double whammy, but you know what I mean? It's nothing. It's placebo. Yeah. You think you're taking that and that's fine. So as, as physicians, we're, I'm not going to put, I won't put my name behind it because my entire brand is I, I vet things. I try to get deep into the science. And if I really believe it, I'll, I'll I, I don't even want to say promote it. I'll say, this is something that we want to offer, or I've looked at this. I don't see the scientific benefit to it. However, mm -hmm. if it's working for you and it's safe, it's okay. Yes. So I, I, I get all that, mm -hmm. but my big contention and i listen i i'm preaching to the choir but i may not be for some of the people watching this show is that lumping in random you know all these supplements that you can buy at, at at cvs and lumping that into what is trying to be done in functional medicine and integrative health mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. saying all that stuff is smoke and mirrors is yeah. it's not even not fair it's 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 in a way it's a malpractice and not in the way we you know malpractice, yeah. but it is it's a mischaracterization of, of 
of, of, of justice. It doesn't, it, it doesn't do anything. And it does a lot of harm for people that can benefit for the things that you're doing where you can actually change their life. But because there's people out here bashing, bashing all of these complimentary things. And a lot of times they're, they do not know what they're talking. They legitimately yeah. have no yes. idea what the science is. It really, really hurts. So thank you for combating the information mm -hmm. with such a clear and concise ability mm -hmm. to just get the information out. Cause anybody that watches this podcast is going to be infinitely more educated mm -hmm. on, you know, women's health and, and men's health and, and, and hormonal management and what they need to do. And if it's inspires them to seek care from a more holistic approach. And that doesn't mean not seeing MDs or D I mean, like just different mm -hmm. in a different right. way. Seek those doctors that are more open-minded because they're going to be able to give you a broader view of your body mm -hmm. and try to put the pieces of the puzzle together, not just find that one. You know, like when you can't find that one piece, you've worked on it and you know, there's like a thousand, it's a thousand piece puzzle and you're like That's on right. 785 and you know, you lost one or your yeah. dog, like put it somewhere, yeah. it, you know, that one piece of that thousand, it, that is not the answer. It's all of it. That's right. Right. It's all right. of it. And yeah. so we have to look at all of it in, in, in its totality. So, I mean, this, this, it, it's, it's been amazing having you on and, and thank you. Thank you so much. But importantly, oh, yeah. you need to tell the audience how they can find you if they want to, you know, work with you, how do they do that? Where, what's the best, like, what's your website? Where do they find yeah. you on social? Oh, so just tell, tell us where, and, and just like spell it out, just you know, take your time. Cause we're going to, we'll have, you know, we'll have all that, you know, available for them so they yeah. can find you because, you know, I, I, I think a lot of people are going to be asking, how do I find Dr. Prouse? How do, how okay. do I get, how do I get well, into her clinic? I do wear many hats um, and not all of them are patient facing. Um, but I do think, you know, for Canadians, check out regenalife.ca. So R-E-G-E-N-A-L-I-F-E, regenalife.ca. Scienceandhumans.com is another platform that will be making its way into the U.S. Uh, shortly as well. And then uh, hormonalhealth.ca. So that's um, uh, Practice Grace Med in Oakville, Ontario. We've got a downtown location in Toronto as well. And yeah, those are the, those are the major, major thing. Oh, I'm also the national medical director for Grip Bar IV, which is just coming into uh, Canada from the U.S. So that's, that's a pretty cool, fun uh, project for me as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's um, amazing. I, I, I love what you're doing and think about it. Listen, it, it, everyone's got to listen, right? You, you practice what you preach. You're involved in a lot you know, that, that was, a that was a lot that, that you just, and, and you, and you seem like you couldn't be happier where you are in life. And, yep. and I feel exactly the same. And I want people to feel this way, That's right. to be able to feel this way. And I don't feel like this. You don't feel like this because we just do the, you know, the, the, the regular stuff, don't sleep well, eat like crap yep. and do all this stuff. We, 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 we're practicing what we're preaching and we're trying to bring this stuff you know, out into the, into the communities, to the people, because people are hurting and they need to yeah. hear these things. They need, they need hope and hope itself is, Huge. is the great releaser of those hormones of love and decreases cortisol and Absolutely. allows you to be open-minded and say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to be kind to myself and, and, yeah. and do these things for myself. So in, in, in conclusion, it's been a whirlwind. Thanks for being on the program. I look forward to to part two, where we'll talk okay. about some really interesting stuff on okay. on uh, on part two. Sounds good. Thanks so much for having me. That was fun. A really good time. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you everybody for being on another episode of Wellness at the Speed of Light. I hope you really enjoyed this one. Pass it on to your family and friends. They need to hear what Dr. Christie Prouse just talked about. It is some, please spread this far and wide and check out all of her websites and the amazing things that she's doing. Cause I've spent the last week doing that and it is some fascinating stuff. So we will see you on the next show. We'll see you next time.